a couple of successful sprint cars in the 1960s and 1970s were nicknamed Old Yeller, perhaps after the famous Disney movie of the same. Don Edmonds, back in 1957, was Rookie of the Year at Indianapolis and later built sprint cars, shipping this one to the Midwest for Sedalia, Missouri's Billy Utes. In 1974 and 1975, Billy was the IMCA sprint car champion. History, the Sprint Car Hall of Fame and Museum can take you right back to the very beginning of the production of the motor car and, consequently, the first race cars. This 1908 Buick began life as a production family sedan, went through several periods of inactivity in the hands of a very caring blacksmith, and reigns today here in 1994 as an example of a classic single-seater open-wheel race car. And this 1932 Chabot Special. This race car was active at the Legion Ascot Raceway, or should we say one of the four versions of Legion Ascot. It was driven by drivers like Ted Horn and Leon DeRay. Legion Ascot, one of the most famous racing names in the history of the sport, certainly a series of the most exciting racetracks, but unfortunately also one of the most lethal. The 1960s, a decade of transition for sprint car racing. The cars were evolving from backyard shade tree mechanics to space age techniques and new metals, although curiously, some very old fashioned devices like hand brakes and hand fuel pumps still adorn these race cars. This red Lampelius machine was one of the more successful and popular of the 1960 decade as drivers like Gordon Woolley and Johnny White and Buzz Barton and Harold Leap drove this car to many victories. Now, it began the decade with a roll bar, but it ended 1969 with a roll cage, the most sweeping and visible change in the history of the sport, and sprint car racing was changed forever. At first glance, super modifieds, actually an abbreviation for the term super modified stock cars, appear very primitive and unrelated to sprint cars. These were popular across America until the 60s, but they were also the direct forerunner, the direct descendants of the sprint cars. This pink lady, number 77, driven by a local driver, Earl Wagner, was very typical of the super modifieds of the day. This was a 1959 track championship car. It is actually a modified Model A pickup body. It's got box frame rails for strength, and the manifold was handcrafted. The 1961 Point Championship car appears extremely primitive, but closer inspection reveals much more. The frame and roll bars are aluminum, and now a quick change rear end has sprouted underneath the tail. A lot more advanced than just its most previous generation of modified stock cars. And also among the last of the handcrafted super modifieds before sprint cars came to the land and assumed the half mile throne. Family tree so similar for sprint cars and Indianapolis cars, it is ironic that it took until the late 1970s for the Roadster design to come to sprint car racing. Remember, Roadsters had dominated Indianapolis car racing in the 1950s. Now, a few drivers like Don Brown, Joe Saldana, and Greg Weld had experimented with Roadsters with a modicum of success on dirt. But when the Roadsters turned to the high bank paved racetracks of the Midwest, and particularly in the United States Auto Club division, that is where they shine. This particular family of Docker Roadsters with Steve Chassis behind the wheel set many, many speed records. Now, there was one driver in the old traditional upright that really was a thorn in the side of the Roadsters. Despite performing in a car that many assumed was outclassed, he repeatedly beat them. His name was Rich Bogler. Just what should a racing driver look like anyway? Whatever your image in your mind is, chances are the Pennsylvania Dutch flying farmer Tommy Hinterschitz doesn't fit the mold, but he certainly was one of the most outstanding sprint car drivers of all times. Seven times he was an Eastern Sprint Car Champion in both the AAA as well as the United States Auto Club. And this race car, active well into the 1970s, almost the 1980s. Rather remarkable when you consider the contemporary Indianapolis car is outdated before the current season is over. You probably assume that a sprint car hall of fame is obligated to have a display honoring the first family of sprint car racing, the Kinzers. Well, we do. This display, 
pretty much chronologues the development of the sprint car during Steve's career. Now, ironically, his first Knoxville Nationals Championship came behind the wheel of a car number 20, not the traditional 11 you are used to seeing him in. This car's chassis was actually borrowed from Bob Trossel, and an engine from Carl Kinzer was inserted when the number 11 car broke down during the preliminaries. Steve's first victory at Knoxville. In 1986, C.K. Spurlock's Gambler Company produced the first down-tube car for Steve Kinzer. It was successful and helped propel Steve to his fourth Knoxville National Championship. In 1991, Steve and chief mechanic and car wizard Carl Kinzer turned their attention to the Maxim sprint car chassis factory. That is the current generation of Kinzer sprint cars, and it has been just as successful as all the others. This 1991 Maxim actually took Steve to the Kings Royale win. But perhaps the crowning achievement of this display of the Kinzer clan, which includes a uniform from the family patriarch Bobby, artifacts from the career of Mark, and several other pieces of memorabilia courtesy of the Hoosier Auto Racing Fan Club in Indiana, is this full-size bass wood carving of Steve Kinzer. Commissioned by Harry Whitehorse of Madison, Wisconsin, one of the most well-known native artists, it depicts the king on his throne at Knoxville. In the 1960s, no chassis builder was more prolific than Des Moines' Bob Trossel, and this was his first work. The transition from supermodified to sprint car was never better demonstrated than through this Trossel creation. The car raced intermittently with both divisions back and forth throughout the 60s. Trossel began building cars over frustration with others' work. Before it was over, drivers like Sonny Helms, Jay Woodside, Judd Larson, Gordon Woolley, and Bud McCune had driven his creations to over 300 wins and two Knoxville National Championships. The cars and driver uniforms are certainly the most visible, most colorful parts of the display, but everyone knows that the engine evolution is a huge part of the sprint car story. You can follow that quest from the simple carbureted flatheads to a brand new aluminum fuel-injected shaver, a state-of-the-art monument. The National Sprint Car Hall of Fame and Museum is living, breathing, and growing Americana. The importance for motor racing is tangibility. In recent years, television has proven that racing may be America's most active professional sport. Now, unlike Indy cars, Winston Cup stock cars, and the most exotic forms of sports car road racing, sprint car racing is attainable for almost every citizen of the land, be their expression be participation or just as a fan. A major sprint car race is now a medium-sized teeming city. Legions of fans, many in spacious motorhomes and thousands of hardy souls in shelters, let's say, closer to nature, journey thousands of miles, often spending the entire week preceding an event and injecting the local economy. The National Sprint Car Hall of Fame and Museum is a microcosm of all of this activity and provides an opportunity for fans and businesses alike to participate. The Hall of Fame is open every day, year-round, and can make special presentations available to your specific group. If you would like to be a part of history by loaning or donating sprint racing items of interest or financial support by becoming a sustaining member of the National Sprint Car Hall of Fame and Museum, call today, toll free, 1-800-874-4488. Your help in any way is greatly appreciated.